Well, good morning. good morning. It's good to see you on this rainy day in February. If it's raining on the outside, I believe it's raining on the inside. How about you? Hey, I want to brag on you pastors for just a moment. The entire family are amazing gifts to the body, gifts to this area, gifts to you. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to plant a church. It's another thing to continue to pastor that church and to raise it up. And you guys are heroes in my mind. Let's give it up for our pastors. Amen. Wow. Wow. And it is an honor to be with you today. It's an honor to, uh, to break the bread of life with you. I've got three words this morning, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to hear the Lord on which way to go. I'm thinking about giving you the first two in a nutshell and then just going with the third one that I think is right. So uh, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit tie it all together. It's always good to have my brown-eyed girl from Arkansas with me, Miss Jamie. Amen. She and, she and I have known each other over 39 years, been married over 37 of those years. We met at Bible College out in, uh, where? where are we? Dallas, Texas. Thank you, honey. In Dallas at Christ for the Nations. Uh, by the way, it's a wonderful school to go to and to be trained in. It's a couple of years. That's well, a three-year deal now. But anyway, met her there, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful adventure up to this point. Looking forward to another, I don't know, 70 years. Yeah, we got two kids. My wife's telling me what to say. We got two kids. We have two children. One's in the ministry. He's got three. So we uh, have three grandchildren, two boys and a little girl. And then our daughter it lives in Birmingham, married to a wonderful fellow. And she's about to have her second little girl. So we're about to be grandparents of five. Come on, Jesus. Right? And that's a whole different world there. Just... Just grandkids alone. How many of you got grandkids? Let me see your hands. Okay. So our kids, my children, have spoiled my grandkids and taken that away from us. So when they come to us, we just feel like we're just disciplining them the whole time because <laughs> their parents, you know, have, have taken that from us. And so anyway, they're going to pay for that. They'll pay for that through their grandchildren, I'm sure. Um, but no, we, we love them all. And uh, it's, a, it's a joy to uh, get to see them. They're a couple of miles from us. They work on the staff with us there at, at the Rock in Huntsville. And uh, we're, we're, we're enjoying this season of being together. I really do want to give you a couple of, couple of things before I get into the main of what I want to share with you today. I, I, I'm not going to, but I was going to talk to you about the anointing. Everybody say the anointing. The anointing. And the anointing comes in three dimensions. All right, I'm really going to nutshell this for you. And I was going to use David and the early disciples as our examples of how you and I can move into those three dimensions. That when David in uh, 1 Samuel 16, that when he was anointed with that horn of oil, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And that was actually, if you, if you study it out, it was more of a salvation anointing. It was a day where he was delivered. It was a day where great freedom came to him. It was a day where there was enough anointing poured on him that he could now take out a lion, take out a bear, take out a giant. Come on, somebody. Uh, that, that first dimension of the anointing in salvation is not to be uh, shrugged or not to be discredited. How many of you are saved this morning? Just wave at me if, you're, if you love Jesus and you're following him. Uh, you, you and I, every single one of us, when we accept Christ and we surrender to him, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, takes residence in us. The anointed one and his anointing. Uh, don't, I think it's mysterious to us sometimes. I think we, we don't understand the anointing, but it literally means to be uh, smeared on or rubbed on. That's, that's what they did when they, when they poured that horn of oil over David. If you could, if you could picture Samuel just kind of rubbing it on him, God rubbing his presence, rubbing his purpose, rubbing his power onto that young teenage boy that literally from that point it says the Spirit of the Lord came on him and then he began that pathway to being the king. Uh, in the New Testament, you'd say, well, what's, what's that for us? Do you remember at the end of the book of John after Jesus had been resurrected and he, and he, right, he brought his disciples to him? And he said to them, have you ever wondered when the disciples really got saved? Uh, everybody, the only way we can be saved is through the blood of Jesus. 
So it had to be after the cross. They were following him. They were doing the best they could. They were obeying him. But how many of you know up until the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were, they were up and down. Peter was denying. Thomas was doubting. Come on, somebody. Right? And so once Jesus, after he's resurrected, looks at him and says, receive the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says he breathed upon them, that was the point of salvation for them. Same anointing that came on David in the Old Testament was the anointing that came on them in that moment. The second level of anointing or dimension of anointing was when David was anointed by the elders of Judah. Everybody say Judah. Judah. It was one of the 12 tribes. So the elders came to him. They poured another horn of oil on, on him and said, we want you to be our king. So he became king over one tribe. And his, and his dominion and his authority and, and more increase and more anointing and more wisdom came upon him at that second dimension of the anointing. Y'all stand with me. I know it's a little bit deep, but it's, it's pretty good stuff, all right? What's that second anointing in the New Testament? It was the day of Pentecost, yeah. right? So they've been breathed upon. Now they go and they wait in the upper room. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind, fills the place, cloven tongues of fire over every single one of them. They all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Second dimension, greater anointing. The gospel is proclaimed. Greater boldness comes up on them. Y'all with me so far? But there's a third level, guys. There's a third dimension of the anointing that's available to every single one of us. I don't have time. I wish I was going to preach this to you, but I'm not. <laughs> But there's a cost to every level. How many of you know when you accepted Jesus, you turned away from this world and the things of this world and you sacrificed whatever that was. But really when you think about sacrifice and hell and giving up your flesh and giving up your carnality to receive the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the purity of his holiness and the splendor of his glory into your body, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a carrier now of the presence of God and you and I get to be a conduit that his power flows through. In that third dimension, you see it in Samuel's life over in, I think it's 2 Samuel, when all of the elders of Israel, all 12 tribes now come to him and say, we want you to be king over the whole nation. They take a third horn of oil, they pour it over him, and now how many of you know that his dominion and his increase and the kingdom is now increasing greatly and mightily in his life? Can you see that? So he goes from salvation to baptism to now dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. Come on, he's got power at, at, at uh, the, the anointing for ministry. That's what you and I in the upper room, we're anointed to minister, we're anointed to carry the, carry the gospel, but the Lord wants us to all know there's a, third, there's a third dimension of the anointing. There's a greater anointing for every single one of us. So when David was you know, anointed over the whole nation of Israel, we know what happened. He, he ruled, he reigned, he was... A king after God's own heart. Did he stumble? Did he make mistakes? He sure did. Some really bad ones. Okay? But God didn't ever take his hand off of him or take the anointing off of him because, listen, David was quickly repentant. He was quickly broken. And he quickly changed his ways and turned back to the Lord. Please hear that. That's very important. There's a great price. There's a greater price to pay at a level of, of that second dominion and then even greater at that third dominion. You say, well, where's that in the New Testament? Well, that's Acts chapter 4. You know, they've been anointed. And how many of you know there wouldn't be an Acts chapter uh, 2 if there hadn't been an Acts chapter 1? And there wouldn't be an Acts chapter 3 where the lame man gets healed at the gate called beautiful if there hadn't been a 1 and a 2, right? And there wouldn't have been a 4 if there hadn't been a 1, 2, 3. Come on, somebody. He knows his numbers all the way up to 4. Yes, he does. But at the end, they get persecuted, they get brought in, they get told, hey, don't be, don't be talking about this Jesus, don't be talking about his resurrection, don't be laying the blame and the guilt on us that we're the ones that murdered him. And they, they did everything but beat him and, and kill him. They, just, they verbally said, look, stop sharing this man's name and his story. That's basically what they said. So they all gathered back together at the end of chapter 4. And, they, and the Bible says they, they considered the threats that they had heard. And then they begin to pray and they begin to worship. And this is what they ask God for. They say, God, give us more boldness. The, these are the same guys that were in, in Acts chapter 2. Come on. How long was that? Was it a year? Was it a day? Was it two weeks? Was it a month? How long was it after that that they had been gloriously filled? The church is birthed. Thousands are saved. Come on. And then now we see, just it looks like a few days later, they're gathering again saying, we want more. we got to have more. 
to boldly declare this message and this gospel that you've given us, Lord. To look those threats in the eye and that persecution in the eye and know that we're anointed to overcome it. And it says the place where they prayed was shaken. Come on, amen. And then from that point was when you started seeing angelic visitations. You started seeing Peter's shadow heal people. You started seeing all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles. There was an increase. There was a dominion that came with that third level of, of anointing for those guys. But I'm not going to preach that to you, all right? Oh, got to stay up here. Sorry, camera folks or whoever's watching. Are we live on Facebook? What are we? No? Are we recording? What are we doing? For all of those of you that will be looking on later on, we welcome you. We're at lunch, but enjoy the word. Amen. The second thing I was going to talk about, but I'm, I'm not going to preach it, was that you're a treasure. Everybody say, I'm a treasure. You know, in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that he has put this treasure in earthen vessels. Can you all believe that? That in a clay, frail vessel, the very glory and presence of God has been placed inside of us. That he says, you know what, not only are you my treasure, but I'm going to place my treasure inside of you. And when you look that word up, it literally means that you and I are the, we're the repository. We're the, we're the safe deposit box. We're the treasury of the Lord that he deposits his treasures into. Come on, somebody. What are the treasures of the Lord? The word of God has to be his treasure. Come on, the presence of God has to be his treasure. Right? The promises of God, the presence of God, the, the glory of God is, is, is deposited within these clay earthen vessels. Previously in the chapter before, Paul said, he said this, he said, we, we're not adequate in ourselves. How many of y'all figured that out? If you haven't figured that out and you think you can do something without the Lord, let me, in, let, me let you in on something. You can't. You may can do it at a, at a certain level, but there's a whole anointed level that he wants you to do it at. You may be a pretty good dad or a pretty good mom or a pretty good minister here in the church or pretty good on your job or whatever you do, but he wants to anoint you to do what you do. He wants you to enjoy what you do. Can I get an amen? amen. He, he, wants you to, he, he wants you to be fulfilled and satisfied in what you do. That's why, that's why Paul told the Colossians, he said, hey, everything you do, do it as unto the Lord. If you're washing cars, wash those cars unto the Lord. If you're, clean, if you're digging ditches, dig those ditches unto the Lord. If you're a plumber, plumb unto the Lord. Come on, amen. If you're an electrician, run those wires and flip those switches and make sure everything works unto the Lord. If you're an engineer, if you're a banker, if, if whatever it is, if you're a systems analyst, if you're a, a musician, if, if you're just somebody that's just trying to make it in this life, make it in this life unto the Lord. Amen. Yeah. And watch what he can do when we offer ourselves to him. I was going to talk about the responsibilities of, well, I'm not going to. I don't want to tell you this, all right? I'm not going to preach this to you. But I was going to tell you that you and I have responsibilities as a vessel. Yeah. He said, I put this treasure in a vessel, and so there are things that I require of you. I want yeah. you to be holy. Yeah. Come on, amen. Yeah. I want your vessel to be pure. I want, you to, I want you to watch your tongue. I want you to watch your thoughts. I want you to be diligent to study my word. I mean, there is... There's so many things about the vessel that he expects and requires of us. But here's the wonderful thing, friend, is that whatever he expects or requires, he gives you the anointing and the grace and the ability to do it. Yes. Come on, Jesus. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, so I, I was just going to talk to you about that and how that, how that you and I get to carry his treasure in this earth. We get to be his treasure chest. And the flip side of it is we're his treasure. He looks at us as very valuable in his eyes. We're, we're the pearl of great price. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Amen. So what I want to get to is the word. Y'all ready for this word today? <laughs> oh, well, that was pretty good, Pastor Dave. Three in one. Right? We've got a combo going on. You can get fries and a drink with these three words. I want you to go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. Back in 1971... There was a fellow named Billy Preston who recorded a song called Will It Go Round in Circles. Anybody remember that song? When I was a kid, I used to sing it this way. Will it go? I used to say, here we go round in circles. Uh, super fly high like a bird up in the sky. Well, that's, that's not the word, y'all. It's will it go round in circles and will it fly high like a bird up in the sky. 
You should pull the lyrics up sometime. It's the dumbest song I think I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. It absolutely, my, I got a song, ain't got no melody, I'm going to sing it to my friends. How are you going to sing a song without a melody? One of the verse kind of does make some sense. He says uh, something about, um, I, ain't, I ain't got no moral. Sometimes I give in to the fleshly guy is basically what he's saying. I mean, if you read it from a spiritual angle. Where did I tell you all to go? Numbers? Numbers 14. All right. I need you all to pull this out of me right now, okay? Just these next few moments. I want you to kind of lean into this thing. Just kind of, if you want to scoot up on your chair just a little bit, just kind of lean in and, t and, and suck this thing out of me, all right? Uh, if you amen and wave a hanky and run around this building and, and you know, if, hey, we're going to get out of here at least by 7.30 tonight, so praise God. Um, I think it's obvious to us. I'm going to read to you in, in Numbers 14, verse 33 and 34. Is it not obvious that the Lord, God, the creator of the, of the universe, has set things up in cycles and patterns? Yep. And really, if you look at it just from a practical sense, in circles. Everybody say in circles. So what I want to share with you this morning is that God is a God of cycles and he is a God who operates and moves in circles in our lives. He set the whole universe up to operate this way. How many of you know that we're in winter right now? I know. We are. One fellow told me, he said, sick of all this rain. I said, I have to agree with you. It's rained a lot. Glory to God. But we're in winter time, all right? And how many of you know in just a few weeks, we're going to be in springtime? And then after that, we're going to summertime. And then after summertime, we're going to head back into fall. The leaves are going to change. They're going to fall again. And guess what's coming at the end of the year? Winter time's coming again. Do you see that? After they came off the ark, he said, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be, there's going to be summer and winter. There's going to be spring and fall. The seasons are going to take place. There's going to be seed, there's going to be time, and there's going to be harvest. Amen? Yeah. Some of you are in seed time <laughs> because the time has passed and now it's time for harvest. Yeah. I, somebody needs that today. All right? But... You, you look in the scripture, and we're going we're gonna to find it out. Uh, we're going to find it out today. In Numbers 14, let me just read that to you in 33 and 34. This is what it says. Uh, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Probably not a promise you want to pull out of the promise box in the morning. All right? <laughs> According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. This is coming off of the spies coming back with the negative report. Yep. Everyone know the story? I don't want to go through it. We sent 12 spies in. 12 spies came back. 10 had a very negative outlook and perspective. We're like grasshoppers. They're too big, too many giants. The land is full of all kinds of creepy things and fortified walls and cities. We can't do this. It does flow with milk and honey, though. We did find out that it flows with milk and honey. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb stand up and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have a God who has made us a promise, and he is well able to fulfill that promise. Therefore, we are able to go up and take the country. How many of you know the church today needs some more Joshua's and Caleb's in our midst? Anybody can be a grasshopper. Anybody can see the giants. Anybody can see the fortified walls and cities, the problems, the issues. What we need is some believers who are full of the Holy Ghost, anointed in the third dimension. Come on. Anointed in the third dimension that can say, you know what? We are well able to take this city for the kingdom of God. We are well able to see that every drug addict gets set free through the power of the name of Jesus. We are well able to see every child be fed, be clothed, be nurtured, be adopted, be ministered to, whatever it takes. That's why he left the church on the earth. Not for us to just come to church and listen to guys preach and worship a little bit and give a little bit and serve a little bit. There is such a greater purpose and a greater anointing that is available to every single one of us. You know what? Some of us get stuck in religion. We get stuck in a way. Come on. Some of us get saved, and that's good enough for us. I don't need them tongues. I don't need that baptism in the Holy Ghost. I don't need all that. I got Jesus. Jesus is the one that baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. Is anybody helping me? 
There, there's dominion for you and I. What Jesus came to do, Brother Marcus, was set us back up to God's original design for us, which was put us kind of back up at the top of the food chain. Come on. Right? What did he tell Adam to do? He said, I want you to tend this garden, and I want you to have dominion, and I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Huh? That's the original design. That, that, that fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean how babies and populate the earth. That fruitful and multiply means multiply disciples. Multiply his church. Multiply his kingdom. Let his glory, let his fruit be born. Let, let, how does it, how, what does John 15 say? It says that, that, the, that the world will know that we're his disciples by our love, but also by the great amount of fruit that we bear. That's how the, the Father gets glorified is that when you and I bear much fruit. Why would I only want to just bear some fruit and not get to a much fruit level? Why would I only want a salvation anointing when there is a dominion anointing that is available to me? I'm just trying to stir you up today, help you and I realize that no matter where we are in life or where we find ourselves today and what circumstances and what condition, our finances, our relationships, there's sometimes, look church, sometimes you've got to back up and you've got to, you got to take a panoramic view of what God is doing. Yeah. you got to realize that, that whatever you have missed, boy, please get this, whatever you have missed, whatever you have mistaken, whatever you have, uh, even I'm going to say it this way, even if you have disobeyed, but you have gotten your heart right and you're back on track, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to come around in a circle. It's going to come around in a cycle. It's going to come back around to you. How many of y'all love Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the... The what? Plans. Turn to your neighbor and say, Thank God for plans. Because if we're all truthful, we've messed up some of those plans. And I'm glad he's got another plan. And then if I mess those up, I talked to one guy one day. He said, I think I'm on double Z. He's already made it through A to Z, back through A, and he's back to double Z now. Because God, as long as you turn to Him and as long as you desire Him and as long as you continue to want to walk with Him, my friend, even if you miss it, even if you miss it, you don't hear this stuff much, but He's got plans for you. And you say, well, what if that, what if that first one was really the one? You can't look at it that way. That plan's gone. Come help me. He's got another plan. Is it going to be better? Yeah, it's going to be better. Is it going to be good? It's going to be good. Is it going to be fulfilling? It's going to be fulfilling. It's going to be satisfying. Yeah, it's going to be satisfying. Amen. Is it going to cost something? Yeah. Is there something going to be required of you? Yeah. But is it going to be worth it? Yes. Yes. So, so they come out. God says this. He says, because of your negativity, because of your unbelief, because you don't believe that I'm who I say I am, even though I'm proving it to you on a daily basis now, Ever since I took you out of bondage and I took you out of Egypt, I'm providing for you, I'm feeding you, I'm giving you something to drink, I'm protecting you from the from the armony, armonies, <laughs> from the armonies and from the beast, right? I got a cloud over you by day that's keeping you from getting sunburned. Somebody help me with this. And I got a fire by night to keep the enemy and the beast away from you. I'm going to take care. That's, that's all God was saying. Look, I'm going to take care of you. You're my people. I'm your God. I'm going to take care of you. And they continued to not believe, to not trust, to have idols, to disobey. Come on. And God, what, just like you, if you were a parent, what would you do if your kid, surely you're not just going to continue. There are going to be some consequences. There's going to be some, hey, you're going to have to do this to get back into this favor, into this protection, into this blessing. So you would see him. There's a cycle there's a cycle of the, on the Israelites all through the Old Testament where they would get, you know, they'd get, go into exile. Some war would, uh, uh, enemy would defeat them. They would, you know, they'd be taken prisoners. Their land, everything would be taken away. Then a prophet would come and say, well, if you'll turn to him and cry out to him and repent and burn your idols and, you know, turn away from all these things, stop, stop prostituting, stop all these other things. Look, if you'll just come to me and you'll, and you'll repent, then I'll, I'll come back. I'll rebuke your enemies. I'll bring the glory back. I'll bring the, the covering and the protection back. And we see that pattern over and over and over, that cycle. Y'all realize that when they stepped on the other side of the Red Sea, that it was an 11-mile trip over to where they should cross the Jordan. 
Everybody say 11 miles. Everybody say 11 miles. Can I tell you something? If me and you started walking today, we could walk 11 miles in about four hours, three or four hours, just at a regular walking pace. Yeah. Took them 40 years. Yeah. 40 years. And what? 80% of them died. Only 20%, two tribes out of the... I don't know if my percentages are right. Larry could correct me if I'm close enough. <laughs> but two out of the 12 tribes and their families are the ones that actually crossed over into the promised land like they were supposed to and begin to take the land. So they go around in these circles. I think it's amazing that in uh, Matthew chapter 4 that... Let, let's do this. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 right quick. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me read just a couple of verses to you. Ba -ba -da -bum, ba -da -bum. Um, verse 2 says, You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. Oh, wow. So why was I in the wilderness? Here it is. To humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep my commandments or not. So he humbled us. He allowed us to hunger. He fed us with manna, which we did not know, nor did our fathers know that he might make uh, you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, he goes on. I wish I had time to read the rest of it to you. I'm going to encourage you to read the rest of Deuteronomy 8, maybe this afternoon when you, uh, when you get home. Let, let's jump to verse 14. Let's just jump to verse 14. And, and you know what the Lord's doing? He's saying, hey, I want you all to remember. I want you to remember all I've done for you. I want you to remember that I'm who I say I am, that I keep my promises that's really what he's saying. And then in verse 14, he says, When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and a thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, there it is again, and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Somebody say, the Lord, the Lord wants, to do me good wants to do me good in the end. <laughs> in the end. It's, it's not ironic to me. I think it's pretty incredible. I think it's pretty incredible, Pastor David, that, that in the wilderness temptation of Jesus, his three responses to the devil when he said, it is written about the stones of bread. When he said, it is written about, uh, you know, throwing himself off of a high pinnacle. When he said, it is written about uh, the devil saying, worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. All three of those it is written came out of these chapters when they were in the wilderness experience. These are the very same things that God was saying to them in their wilderness that Jesus was saying to the devil in his wilderness. Come on. I believe that, that Jesus in that moment for every single one of us redeemed all of our wildernesses. It doesn't mean we're not still going to go through them. It just means that they're redeemed and we're going to go through them. We're going to get to the other side of the wilderness. We're going to have a hold of the promise. We're going to know that he's who he says he is, and we're going to say the same things to the devil that Jesus said. Right, right. Hey, why don't you turn these stones to bread? I know you're hungry. You've been fasting. No, I'm going to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Come on, church. I'm going to have such a relationship and an intimacy and a closeness and a communion and a fellowship with him that I just don't even have to eat sometimes. Take your, don't, take your stones and your bread somewhere else. Takes him up and shows him... Shows him all of this. Uh, no, no. Was it the second one where he wanted to commit suicide? Throw yourself down? No, it was the third one. Second one, he said, you know, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this. What did he say? You shall worship the same thing God said to the Israelites. You're going to, in this wilderness, when you get into the promised land, there's going to be a bunch of folks with idols. They're going to try to pull you in. They're going to want you to worship their gods. You shall worship the Lord God and him only. How many of you know that still works for today? I know we're not under the law, but Jesus fulfilled the law so that we could also keep the law. <laughs> Does that make sense? We're not, we don't have to be law keepers. We're not under the bondage of the law. We're under grace now because Jesus has fulfilled the law, but because he fulfilled it, we can keep those commandments. Wow. So then, then the third one, what did he say? Hey, throw yourself down. Doesn't the Bible say that the angels 
will not let you dash your foot against the stone. He's trying to get Jesus to commit suicide. Jesus responds. He says, it is written, you don't tempt the Lord your God. Once Joshua and Caleb got their tribes, their clans, over the Red Sea, they stepped into the promised land. Once, once they came over, what was the first thing that, would, that they faced? Somebody tell me. Jericho, Jericho. right? Yeah. Jericho. Fortified walls and cities. What did the Lord, what was the strategy? What? March around. March around that city one time for six days and don't say a word. Do you understand how miraculous it would be for two tribes of people to not say a word <laughs> for two days? Six days, six days. On the seventh day, go around it seven times. When you hear the trumpet sound, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. They did it, and y'all, the walls came down. And they plundered that city, and they took over, and they drove those enemies out, and it was the very first victory that they won in the promised land. So you see this circular pattern. You see this cyclical pattern continuing even out of the wilderness into the promised land. That's in Joshua 6, 15 and 16 and verse 20 for those of you taking notes. How many of you know that wilderness cycles are different from promised land cycles? I'm going to say that again. Wilderness cycles are different from promised land cycles. Now, I'm going to go Old Testament on you for just a moment, and then I want to talk about a wilderness in the New Testament and what that looks like. Because I really believe that there are some folks today that you would, if we talked about it, you would probably say, yeah, you know, I kind of feel like I'm in a wilderness. I kind of believe I'm in a wilderness cycle or season or moment in my life. I'm, I'm walking through some things. I'm, I, 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 there's some testing going on. There's some proving going on uh, of my faith and, and of my heart uh, before the Lord. So... In a wilderness cycle in the Old Testament, and possibly in, in you today, <laughs> he was dealing with rebellion, yeah. wasn't he? That's right. Think about it. He was dealing with the flesh. He was dealing with their fears. He was dealing with their idols. He was dealing with their disobedience. He was dealing with their attitude. He was dealing with how they understood and submitted to authority. He was obviously dealing with their stubbornness, with their murmuring, and with their complaining. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I believe for you and I now on this side of the cross, the resurrection, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Spirit being poured out upon all flesh, I, I do believe that there's still times that you and I go through wilderness experiences. Let me, let me qualify. I think that some of us go through wildernesses that we have brought on ourselves. Yeah. It's like our own wilderness that we, by our choices and by our lifestyle and by whatever it might be, we find ourselves in a place of kind of testing and humbling and being proven and those kind of things. We want to be in wildernesses like Jesus was. The Bible says in Matthew 4 that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Hey, friend, if you've got to get in a wilderness, if I've got to be in a wilderness, I want the Holy Spirit to take me into it. I don't want it to be of my own making, and I don't want it to be in some cycle or in some circle that the devil's trying to perpetrate upon my life. So when the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit takes you into a wilderness, why would he do that now as a New Testament believer? Some for the same reason as an Old Testament, but really just to prove himself. Come on to prepare you and to get you ready for more possession, for more, for more promise, for more dominion. He's, just, he's got to show you <laughs> that you've got what it takes. He's got to show you that he's who he says he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do, and he's going to do it every time. Come on. He's going to do it every time. So it'll feel sometimes like a wilderness, like a, like a pressure, like a perplexity, like a distressing moment. Uh, it may get stressful. It may get hard. You may, you may feel like, you know, from time to time my prayers are just kind of bouncing off the ceiling here. I don't, I, I don't know. He's wanting you to trust him. That's all it is. I want to teach you a greater trust. I want to, I want to show myself to you in, in a greater way to prepare you for what I'm about to give you and what I'm about to require and ask of you to do. That's really, that's really what I see happening 
in a wilderness experience for us. But what about that promised land cycle? What about that? Let's talk about that for a minute. See, a promised land cycle deals with possessing the promise. It deals with obtaining the promise, with destroying the giants, with applying God's strategy, with being obedient, with applying the right attitude, operating in the faith and the authority that you received when you were in the wilderness. Is anybody listening today? I'm giving you some pretty good stuff to chew on and to walk out and to live in. See, even if you're in a wilderness, it's okay. Even if you're in a wilderness of your own making, you can come out of that if you do what they did. If you say, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to be teachable. I'm going to keep his word. I'm going to say those three things one more time. If you find yourself in a wilderness cycle, those are the three things that you want to do. You want to humble yourself. You want to remain teachable. And you want to keep his word. Guess what? I'm going to say it one more time. If you find yourself in a self-made wilderness or in a spirit-led wilderness, you want to be humble. You want to be flexible, pliable. You want to be moldable. You want to be teachable. Right? And then you want to keep the word that is in you and that he is, de he is depositing and, and, and watering and sowing into you during that season. That's how you thrive in a wilderness cycle. Here's how you thrive in a promised land cycle. Pastor Dave, if you want to come back or whoever's going to come, whoever wants to come to the keyboard. How do I thrive in a promised land cycle? Man, if you got your phones, I'd put this in there. If you're taking notes, I'd make sure I take a good note. Because that's where we want to spend most of our lives is in that promised land cycle that Jesus died <laughs> and resurrected and ascended to, to, to place us in. Now, I, I love what, what Pastor Marcus said this morning about where the head, not the tail. In that same portion of Scripture in Deuteronomy, it talks about how that the blessings of God will come up on you and overtake you. Everybody look at me. Look. So you're here. Here's the blessings of God. You're moving in the cycle, in the, in the, in the promised land. The blessings of God are going to come upon you and at some point they're going to overtake you. I remember when I first got a revelation of that, I'm like, Lord, bring a Mack truck of blessing and overtake me. Run me over from behind. I don't even have to have a warning. You don't even have to blow the horn. Come on, amen. What happened to Chris? He just got run over by a Mack truck of blessings. Glory to God. Amen. How am I going to thrive in the promised land? I'm going to focus on the one who made the promise. Yes. I want everybody to say that back to me. Focus on the one who made the promise. Guys, if we get so caught up in the promise and obtaining the promise, and when is the promise going to happen? And when is it going to come to pass? And when is the blessing going to come? No, I'm going to keep my eyes on the blesser. I'm going to keep my eyes on the one who made the promise. I'm going to keep my focus on the one who said, look, you can have this. It's yours. But there's going to be a process to get to it. You say, why, Chris? Why, do, why does it always seem to have to have a process? Why does there have to be time? Because if he gave it to you right now, you'd blow it. You'd squander it. You'd mess it up. Or he would have already gave it to you. God... Y'all listen, God don't just give stuff just because He's a giver. There's always a purpose. There's always a picture. There's always a, a greater reasoning of why He wants you to have greater anointing. Not just so people can fall out. Not just so people can shake and tremble. Come on, amen. Not just so they can shout and swing from a LED light. <clears throat> we used to swing from chandeliers. Now we swing from LED lights. They call us holy rollers. What they say is truth. They knew what we were holding, rolling about. They'd be rolling too, right? It's a little, little brevity there for somebody. Very serious. <laughs> Focus on the one who made the promise. Listen for the strategy to see the promise fulfilled. Listen. 
Do you remember how they took Jericho and how it was awesome? And then they didn't inquire of the Lord. They didn't see, hey, how do we need to do AI? What do we need to do here? And they went up there, took a small group, and those folks at AI kicked their tails, sent them home running. And they go to the Lord and say, what's going on? What happened here? And he says, you didn't inquire of me. I got a different strategy for different promises. I got a different strategy for different, for different mountains, for different giants. You got to come to me. Listen, I want relationship with you. I don't want you to just go out and possess land. I want you to come talk to me. I want us to strategize about it. I want, I want you to be spirit-led. I want you to know that my voice is leading you. Come on, amen. You can't assume that the way you got victory over one promise or one giant or one issue in your life is the same way that you're going to get victory over the next one. It's all about relationship. It's all about the journey. It's all about the fellowship and the communion. You say, well, why didn't he just tell us it all at one time? Why didn't he just lay it all out for us? Because we're not ready for it. If we were ready for it, that's the way he would have done it. You look at some people and you go, wow, and God really uses them. Wow, there's an anointing on them. How many of y'all see people like that? Right? Great anointing on them. Ministry flowing you know, provision, whatever that you might say, wow, it just seems like God's favor is on them. Can I tell you something? They've been through some wilderness. They've been through some testing. They've been through some humbling. They've been, they, there was a cost that they had to pay to get to that level and to that point. How many of you are familiar with Smith Wigglesworth? That name, see your hands. Dude that lived in the previous century. Amazing miracle signs and wonders. I think credited with raising, I think, 10 people from the dead. One of them was his wife. Raised his wife from the dead. She, she died. He raised her back. She sat up and said, what are you doing? She said, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm lonely. I can't live without you. I need you. She said, you got to let me go. She said, you have got to let me go. And you, you got to see what I saw. And she said, he said, okay. They talked for a minute. She laid back down and died. Went back down. Years after that, she would go, he would go, he would go, and just lay on her grave and cry out to God because they missed her so much and he was so lonely. And at the end of every prayer meeting on that grave, he would say, Lord, give me a double portion of what she had. And a greater anointing would come and more people would get healed and more people would get saved. What most of us don't know that him and his wife had a 14-year-old son that come, contracted some kind of disease that died when, the, when he was just 14 years old. You see what I'm saying? There's a cost. There's a price. There, 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 there's things that you can't explain that are in the, in, the, in the sovereignty of God category that He knows best and He, he knows what He's doing. And we, have, we just have to trust Him. We just have to trust Him. Okay? Focus, listen, and then here it is. Obey. Obey what He says do. Obey what the Word tells you to do. Don't, make, don't overcomplicate this thing. Don't... Don't, don't make it harder than it is. Most of the promises that God has for us will say something like this. If you will do this, then I will do this. The cool thing about the if we will do it is that he gives us the anointing and the grace and the ability to do our part. And his part's always greater than ours. I can't raise nobody from the dead. I can't heal nobody. I can't save nobody. Come on. But I can yield this body to him and say, Holy Spirit, let me be conduit for your glory to flow through today. Amen. Stand to our feet. Some of you are in cycles that need to be broken. They are demonic. They are of, of the enemy. They are of an addictive nature. Some of you have some character issues that the, that the Lord wants to, wants to uh, deal with. I'll just say it that way. Okay? And I'm going to just be real blunt and real honest with you. The more you sit through services like this and the Holy Spirit pricks and pulls and prods and convicts and points out and you, you give this to Him, the harder your heart will get. Come on. The harder your heart will get and the more difficult it will be for you to just open up and let the freedom of the Lord come. The Spirit of God come 
break every chain, cancel every lie, uproot every curse, overthrow every pain, heal your broken heart, restore your messed up mind. Come on. It's who He is. It's what He does. He's really, really good at it. Amen. Some of us are in cycles that we've made of our own. We just made some really poor choices. And now we're living the consequences of it. Some of us are in a promised land cycle and just need just need the grace and the, and the wisdom and the humility to continue to walk it out and be a distributor of His resources. Can I get an amen? Because some of you, He wants you to be the lender and not the borrower. Did I say lender? He wants you to be the lender and not the borrower. And that's not just in finances. Come on, amen. He wants you to be able to lend the peace of God, lend the joy of God, lend the love of God, and not expect any payment for it. Right? Matter of fact, every outreach that we do from this place, you correct me if I'm wrong, we are giving to and we are sowing into and we are serving, we are loving and clothing and feeding and praying for and ministering to people that really probably can't pay anything back. Pastor David, you know this, man. You learned this early on. That when you do that, when you do that, God is going to make sure that Life Church never has a need, never has want, never has lack. He's going to make sure that there's plenty of people, plenty of workers, come on, plenty of promise, plenty of provision, plenty of everything to go around. That's why you should be encouraged to be in a house like this, under leadership like this, being led out into a city and into the highways and, and, and hedges and byways, and I ain't even going to ask you to raise your hand how many of you are actually doing that. All right? Ain't no shame in my game. I'm not shaming you. I'm trying to stir a fire up inside of you to pick up this vision with them and run and touch people that may never come to this piece of God. They may never come. But that's not why we're bringing it. I'm not bringing it for you to come. I'm bringing it because you may never come. I'm bringing it because that's what Jesus tells us to do. That's the anointing. That's the cycle you want to get in. You want to, you want to pull them into your cycle of favor and bless. Glory to God. All right. All right, so the altar's open, okay? Self-made cycles, destructive cycles, promised land cycles. I'm not going to, I'm not going to differentiate between you, okay? I don't want the enemy to try to embarrass anybody or condemn anybody that needs to come right now. But I'm going to ask you to step out and come up here, and I'm going to come by right quick. I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you, okay?